So we're going to talk about something called residuality, which is the topic of my PhD thesis, which I'm just wrapping up, and it involves fusing together ideas from software engineering and the complexity sciences. And the problem that we're trying to solve with this work is to answer the question of why is software architecture so difficult? Why is it so hard? Whenever you ask a senior software architect, any software architect, why does your design look like this? How did you make these decisions? The answer usually is, I don't really know. I don't know exactly why I've made these decisions. Why is there two components here, not one, not three? It's like, yeah, it felt good, you know? There's actually research that shows that we act on gut feeling. There's a couple of huge problems that we have when we're describing our software architectures. And the biggest one is this, time, change, and uncertainty. When we draw a picture of an architecture, it tends to be two-dimensional, a bunch of lines and boxes. And it doesn't capture the fact that an architecture is never static. An architecture that you draw in the initial phases of a project will not look like itself after you've started to develop it, and it will not look like itself in six months, and it will not look like itself in a year. And the reason that it won't look like itself from its initial beginning is because things change constantly, and there's no way of capturing that change over time in our architecture diagrams or in the way we talk about our decision making. And the reason for that is because there's an enormous amount of uncertainty. We don't know what's going to change in our architectures. And this causes us some enormous problems. A second problem that we have in software architecture is that we still haven't properly arrived at what is the unit of software architecture. What is the base building block of what we do? If you go back to ancient Greece, they thought that the building blocks of our world were earth, fire, wind, and water. And that seems a bit silly from today's perspective, but that gave us what we needed to build on in order for the natural sciences like physics to say that, well, the, 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 nat the building block that we base all of our work on is the atom, or later, the Newtonian particle. Chemists have the molecule. That's the base unit of chemistry. And a biologist will work from the cell. And they build up from there. And that's the sign of a mature science. For software, we've been on a bit of a journey. And we're not quite sure who we are yet. And if you go back 60 years, you'll find that we thought about things in terms of machines. And then punch cards and procedures and modules. And then we brought in some business ideas like processes and features and some things like patterns. If you meet two software architects talking to each other, very often you'll find that they're having a very confused conversation because both of them are operating from a different perspective. They have a different base unit. And what we're going to look at today is a new unit of software engineering, and that unit is called the residue. And this is the way we will think, of, this is what we will think of as the building block for our software architecture. So it will make it easier for us to communicate with each other about what we've actually done and also solve this huge problem of time change and uncertainty, because this is a unit that's able to capture those things. Before we dive into that, there's a couple of really important concepts that we need to understand. And this is fundamental to understanding our role um, as designers of software systems. So there are different kinds of systems in the world that we work with. And systems just a fancy word for a bunch of stuff connected to other stuff. And some of these systems that we work with are ordered. And by ordered, we mean that they're highly constrained. They're highly structured. Um, their future states can be predicted. And you can test an ordered system. And when you test it repeatedly, you'll mostly get the same behavior over and over and over again. And so something like a car is an ordered system. Even though it's got 30,000 different parts, it's still ordered. It's understandable. It has a schemata and all of those things. Software is an ordered system. It's actually quite simple. That's scary. People, some people don't like it when I say that, because we like to think that software is very complex. Software is highly constrained. It won't do anything you don't tell it what to do. The complexity comes from the fact that you tell it to do the wrong things. You all know that already. Some systems are disordered, and a disordered system is a completely different thing. It's very loosely constrained. Stuff is still related to other stuff, but those relations are changing, and so is the stuff. 
and you won't find any patterns that you can hold on to in a disordered system. And as soon as you think you have or convince yourself that you have, those patterns will change. And this is this describes all human systems and all business systems are disordered. They're unpredictable, they're not controllable. The problem we have with software architecture is that our job is to design an ordered system, an architecture, a set of components that are related to each other that behave in a particular way. And this is what we go to university for, this is what we learn. We learn how to work with ordered systems, how to design them, build them, test them, torture them, put them into production, all of those things. And then the next thing we do is we take this poor little innocent, ordered, structured system and we put it into this bubbling cauldron of madness, which we call a business. And in that business, you have employees, and you have departments, and you have customers, and you have competitors, and you have a market, and you have a society. And all of those things are moving all the time. None of them are standing still. It's a pure disordered system. It's not predictable. It's not mappable. And what happens is that this thing here, this X, pops up in this madness. And nobody knows what X, where X came from. Why did it happen? Nobody knew it was going to happen. It wasn't in the specification. It wasn't in the requirements. It's a surprise. An X can pop up at the end of your first sprint, or it can pop up after six months. And the problem is that X, there's more than one of them, and they're constantly popping up. And when these Xs pop up, they tear our architecture to pieces. And they make, it look, you make, make us look silly. It's like, why did you do it like that? X popped up, and now we have to rebuild the whole thing. And this happens so often that, we, the, that we've just accepted it. This is the way the world is. Now, the way that enterprise architects have traditionally solved this problem is almost genius. We use this magic device called scope, which is this little inner circle. And we say to our business stakeholders, tell us what this circle is. You set the scope, not us. And that means we only have to deal with X's that are inside this little circle. And then we can write a contract and we can start charging them. And the next thing that happens is that X, this red X, will pop up out here because reality never goes away, even for enterprise architects. And what happens is that that X will have exactly the same effect. It'll tear the architecture apart. But because we've used this idea of scope and contract, we say to our customer, now you have to pay us again. It was you that was wrong, not us, which is a fantastic business model and one that we maybe should keep quiet about. But they're, they're starting to ask awkward questions. <laughs> so if the world really was this terrible, there would only be one solution to this problem, and that solution would be called agile. And the only way to solve this problem would be to deal with this red X whenever it pops up. But what we've seen um, over the last 25 years is that when that red X pops up and you deal with it there and then and just expect surprises, you end up over a period of time with a very, very flaky, shaky architecture. And that's one of the issues with just reacting to change. What's interesting is that in our business, in our industry, there's a whole bunch of architects, senior architects, who've spent their entire careers building systems that survive this red X and they make it awkward for everybody else. Because our customers will point at them and say, why can't you do it like that? And when you go to these senior architects and you say, how are you doing this? What did you do? What do you do that's different? What they will say is, if they're honest, they'll say, I don't really know. And if they're normal, they'll say, it's because I'm magic. And we don't really know, and so my project for the last 10 years has been finding out what is it that, that senior architects do that allow them to deliver at this seemingly magical level of delivering for future that nobody else can predict. And to do that, we're going to dive into the complexity sciences. Because one of the things I noticed when I started to talk to these senior architects, the thing that was different between them and everybody else, was that they were really comfortable with the concept of uncertainty when they meet stakeholders who don't know what they want or say they know what they want but then change their minds or are obviously making stuff up. They're comfortable. 
They don't start crying and demanding a requirement specification so they can work. They deal with the customer's inability to describe the environment. So I did what all good researchers do. I took this concept of uncertainty, I went to Google, and I typed it in. Sorry, Bing. <laughs> I used to work for Microsoft. And so, <laughs> so you went, go to Google, and you type in uncertainty, and you, it comes up. It turns out there's an entire scientific discipline that deals with uncertainty, and it's called the complexity sciences. And what's really fascinating is that after a couple of years, I was able to describe software engineering in terms of tools from the complexity sciences. And this is really interesting. So one of the first things we look at is a concept called random simulation. Random simulation is how you solve a problem when you don't have access to all the data, or there's simply too much data, and you don't have any access to patterns or, or natural laws. So if I show you this problem, and I say, look, I have a square of side x. And inside that square, I have a circle. What is the area of the circle? And everyone who's been indoctrinated into STEM will immediately start looking for the radius of this circle and feel a, a, a flutter of panic when you realize you can't get there. And you're brought back to your high school math exams, and you're like, I don't, I don't know what to do here. And the truth is, you can't find r. So pi r squared is not a possibility here. So what we do is, instead of using a formula, we just throw darts at it. And the first dart lands here in the middle of the circle. And the second dart misses the circle and hits the square. And that means, since I'm no good at darts, I'm, tar I'm, not, I'm not targeting it, that means that the circle must be half the area of the shape, which means it's x squared over 2. And that probably feels a little bit uncomfortable. You're probably thinking, no, that's cheating. That's weird. This is, this is some hippie stuff. It turns out if you throw a whole bunch of darts at the shape, you actually get really, really accurate results for the area of the circle. And not only that, but you can move away from circles and you can figure out the area of any blob. Now, the problem that we have in software architecture is that we have these techniques and tools that we use, like requirements engineering and risk management and the use of patterns and, and ideas for decomposition. And we live in the belief that all of those ideas are pi r squared, that, we, that it's a formula, that it's structured, that it's analytical, but it's not. The truth is that when we work as, with gathering information about the environment in software engineering, we're just throwing darts usually at some poor stakeholder who's running away from us and doesn't want to talk to us about it. Um, and so what we do is actually much closer to random simulation, but we've created a narrative where it's structured and ordered. A second idea from the complexity sciences that's really interesting to us is the concept of a Kaufman network. And so Stuart Kaufman was a biologist and a complexicist who worked in the 1960s. And he wanted to figure out, how did we get from an ocean of amino acids all just floating about, minding their own business? How did we get from that over the course of several billion years to the Beatles? How does that happen? And he came up with the idea of a Kaufman network, which is also known as a random binary network, which mimics the behavior of amino acids. And it's binary because every node in this network has two possible values, one or zero. And so a good way to think about this is to think about it as light bulbs. These nodes are all either on or off. And they're random because every light bulb has a tiny little bit of code inside it. And when that code runs, the light bulb is, decides, am I on or am I off? And then you get a little button here. And when you press the button, it gives an electrical signal to every light bulb. They all run this little bit of code and they decide to be on or off, which means every time you press it, you're going to see a different pattern of light. Kaufman ran this with the number of nodes set to 100,000. 100,000 nodes. It was a computer simulation. He didn't have 100,000 light bulbs. That would have been weird. When you sit and press this little button, you will see or there, there is a possible 2 to the power of 100,000 states 
for this network, two to the power of 100,000 patterns of light. That number is so big, it doesn't fit in our heads. If you sat and pressed this little button, you'd be dead for a very, very long time before you seen, one of, one, seen two patterns the same, or a recurring pattern. Kaufman then does something really interesting. He links the nodes together, again, trying to mimic the behavior of, of these, these basic biological structures. And he starts pressing his little button. And the way they're linked together is that this little node can send a message to its neighbor once it executes. And, so, and it can tell its neighbor, I'm a one or I'm a zero. And its neighbor will take that information and recalculate its own decision. And you'll see a little bit of blinking now when you press the button. And he did this, and he started to notice something strange. He started to notice that there were recurring patterns. Come, he could see the same pattern over and over again. And so what he did was he went in and he counted them. And there were 317 recurring patterns. Now that's an enormous drop from 2 to the power of 100,000. If your requirement specification has 2 to the power of 100,000 requirements, it's over. Give up. 317 is still not good, but we can live with that. 317 possible states in this system. And he called these states attractors because the system just seems to keep coming back and coming back to this over and over again. It seems like it's attracted to this particular configuration, to this particular phase state. And you can see this in biology. You can see how bats and birds and insects, certain insects, have all developed the capacity to fly. They all have wings. They didn't get together and have a meeting and share the pattern. It's just, it's, it's an attractor for biological systems. And he discovered other things about these attractors. He discovered there's three numbers that are really important in how we, in, in determining how many attractors a system will have. N is the first number. And this is the number of nodes in the network. As the number of nodes rises, the number of attractors rises. K is a measure of how connected the network is. The more connections that you have in your network, the more attractors you get. And not only that, but when, as you raise K, you get a lot more blinking and weirdness in between attractors as the system jumps from state to state. And the final value is called P. And P is a measure of a node's bias. And what that means is that a node is restricted so that it can only send messages in this direction. And we say you can't send messages this way. That means that that node is now biased towards sending messages in one particular direction. In software engineering, I'm sorry, when you raise P, when you raise the bias of your nodes, then you decrease the number of attractors in the system. So you can raise N, you can raise K, and you use P to decrease the number of attractors. And as software engineers, you already know this. You've already instinctively know this. And when you ask an architect why two components, not one, not three, they've actually done this in their architectures. But we don't have a language to really talk about it because we're trapped talking about patterns. And the number of nodes, we've known for a very long time that you don't want to let the number of nodes get too high in your architecture you know, because it becomes difficult to manage. K, the number of links. You, anyone who's worked in enterprise integration knows that you need to keep the number of links between systems down, or it gets chaotic. And P as bias, which is a, an abstract concept, P as bias in software engineering is best expressed in the tenets of service orientation. A component will only communicate over a certain protocol according to a certain policy using a certain schema and a certain contract. All of those things, when we add them on top of our components, on their, and control their communication, we're biasing our software architectures. And when we do that, what you're actually doing is lowering the number of attractors that your, your system can, can visit. And so from the perspective of complexity science, software engineering is quite simple. It's a two-step algorithm. A random simulation of the environment followed by an NKP analysis of potential software structures. That's all we do from a complexity science perspective. 
They think we have it easy. That's all very interesting, but now we're going to use something called residuality theory, which is going to make the simulation more random and the NKP analysis more explicit. Because even though we do these things as, soft, as software engineers, we don't know that we're doing them. We've wrapped them up in layers and layers of process and frameworks and ideas and memes and trends over the last six decades. Residuality theory is just a little bit of a reality check for enterprise architecture to say, look, these are the things that you can actually say about the world. Everything else is speculation. And so we start out with a system. And this is a business system. And inside this system, we have some software somewhere. The first thing that residuality theory says is that you cannot map this system. You cannot map it. It's too big, and it's moving. It's changing. So you can't sit down and draw a diagram of it because by the time you get even a little bit into that diagram, the system won't be the same anymore. And so this is bad news for the enterprise architects in the basement showing each other their pictures. The only thing we can say to be true about this system is that something is going to happen. That's the only thing you can say about a complex system. Unfortunately, we don't know what that thing is. So we call it X. Something is going to happen. And when that something happens, the system is going to be changed. And when the system, this piece of the system, the leftover, we call this the residue. It's the leftover of the system after a change. The residue is also a complex system. So the only thing we can say that's true about it is that something's going to happen. And we call that X dash. And what we can say is that the next residue, the future of the system, will be a function of the old one. The residue that's left over in step two controls the possible paths in step three. And as an architect, then the lesson we take from this is that you can't map everything. You can't write everything down in this system. Requirements won't work in a complex system. And the Agile movement figured that out 25 years ago. We don't know what X is. We don't know what X dash is. The only thing we control as software architects is the software residue, the way that our system is going to fall apart whenever it's pushed in a direction we don't expect. That's a very pessimistic view of architecture, but it's necessary. What does this do? How does this change our view of the world? If we go back to our original problem of this ordered little system inside this complex mess, Suddenly, we don't have to worry that much about the complex mess because we've learned about Kaufman's attractors. And we realize that you don't have to jump into this bubble and grab every single variable and understand exactly all its properties and what values they can have. We only care, as architects, we only care about the attractors, which means the system suddenly gets much, much smaller. We go from 2 to the power of 100,000 to 317 in a single jump. And so what we have to do is build our architecture to survive in as many of these attractors as possible. There's only one small problem with that. We don't know what the attractors are at the outset. And the way we figure out what the attractors are is through random simulation. We just throw darts at it. So we just come up with something. And so this first X, I can say, what happens when a competitor drops their price? When a competitor drops their price, what is the business attractor? You maybe don't know that, so you go and talk to some business people and say, what would we do if a competitor dropped their price? And what would they tell you? We'll buy the competitor, we'll leave the market, we'll change our offering, we'll change our business processes. And with that attractor, you go to your architecture and you say, would my architecture have survived in this attractor? And the answer usually is no. These two components would have been revealed to be in the wrong place, doing the wrong thing, connected in the wrong way. But we haven't built anything yet. So we can add this little green component in here and say, if we'd had this little green component, we would have survived. And we park that idea over here, and we call this residue number one. And then we throw another dart, and it describes another attractor, maybe something like, what happens if the pound drops against the euro? 
and we realize that we need this little orange thing to survive there, and we call that residue number two, and we do a, a third one, and eventually what we end up with is this naive architecture, which we started out with, which can be completely random. It can be anything. And a whole bunch of residues that describe the behavior of our architecture, slightly changed in lots and lots of different attractors. And these residues are the building blocks of our architecture. And what we do now is we push all of these together into a single coherent architecture. And we'll look at some tools for doing that towards the end. And then we find something weird about this kind of architecture. It starts to survive things that weren't in the specification, and it starts to do it pretty regularly. And we've reached that point of saying, I'm magic, but not really knowing why. And the reason why is incredibly simple. When I have a residue, which is just one block of this, that residue will survive in at least one attractor. But it may survive, and usually survives in many attractors. And every single attractor has many, 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 many Xs, many things that can push the business into that same state, that same attractor. Because the mathematical relationship between the number of things that can happen and the number of attractors that are possible is a massive, massive difference. And so if my architecture survives, so let's say I come up with this one little X, I identify this attractor, which helps me identify this residue. I now survive in all these attractors, which means I survive all of these X's in this list. Now, I don't know what they are. I don't know where they are. I've never even thought about them. No one's ever discussed them. But when, they, when one of them kicks off, my architecture's going to survive. And this is why. It's a really simple mathematical relationship. And those senior architects who've been delivering over decades of their careers and solving these problems all they have done is accidentally stumbled upon this mathematical relationship that exists in any software architecture. And once we know it's there, it seems really obvious. And it's kind of like, oh, whoops, that's why. One of the problems, one of the things that stops teams being able to do this is something called the curse of dimensionality. In statistics, it means that it's very hard for us to generate random samples in large data sets. Because what we do is we try to be correct. And all of our teaching as programmers is all about being correct. And so we throw all our darts, and we all hit the same mysterious place on the, on the board. And if you do this with your friends, everyone wants to hit roughly the same place, because we don't want to be different. right? We all want to think the same. And this gives us a very skewed picture of what that circle might be. And so the way out of this is to become a little bit more playful. And what we say is one of the first X's that we use is that giant fire-breathing lizards are going to come out of the Thames and destroy London. And this is the point where management starts to get a bit scared. See, and so when this happens, what is the attractor? What's, what state is our business in? Right? Well, let's say London's not working so well. There's big lizards walking about, setting fire to things. Um, how do we solve this problem? And you'll say, well, maybe we'll have um, another data center um, and another oper set of operations, say, in Birmingham. And while this might seem ridiculous, all we've done is identify this one little X here. All these other Xs are going to be things like, what happens if there's flooding? What happens if there's a pandemic and London isn't on fire, but nobody can get there anymore? What happens if there's a train strike, which, you know, every other week? Every time I come to speak here, it feels like they're checking the conference website and saying, he's coming. Shut the trains down. Um, the <laughs> this will uh, potential foreign invasion, social unrest, electricity, um, outages, all of these things were protected against. But we didn't have to figure out the probability of these things, which is a big waste of energy and impossible anyway. We just thought about lizards, and that's much easier. <laughs> to do, believe it or not. I'll give you a concrete example of how this works. So we're building a system that's going to manage a global network of fast chargers for uh, electric cars. And it's going to be a cloud-based system. And the point of it is to make sure that only our customers can use these chargers. And so when you sign up as a customer, 
and give us your money, we send you a little key fob. You take that key fob, and you drive up to the charger, and you hold it up against the charger, and there's a little blip. It goes up to the cloud. It looks you up and says, yes, you've paid your monies. You can, you can charge. Very simple architecture. And what we do then is we start coming up with Xs. We start stressing the system with these Xs. And, one th and this is what it looks like. So every row in this spreadsheet is just a residue. And so we come up with this one, which is called a field login. And the field login is um, what's the business attractor when this little key fob doesn't work? Well, the business attractor isn't particularly good because you've got someone in an electric car stuck. They can't go anywhere. They can't charge. They've got no juice left in the battery. And what they're going to do is they're going to call the emergency number, which is actually meant for people who are getting electrocuted, or maybe someone else. They maybe won't be able to reach the phone. But it, this is, uh, and this is a problem for us. So we change it, and we use something called ALPR, Automatic License Plate Recognition. So we scan everyone's license plate as they drive into the lot, and we let everyone charge without restrictions, and we just let them drive off, because it's cheaper and easier to let them drive off than it is to have them stuck and complaining and maybe build a customer contact center to solve this problem. So automatic license plate recognition changes the way we do things. The next X or stressor that we need to deal with is that people are going to drive into these things. Okay, it's inevitable. It happens a lot of petrol stations. And so what we do is we have some redundancy. Let's have a few extra chargers on our lots. And we have security cameras so that we can see who did it and talk to their insurance company. And the next one that's interesting is number 12, which turns out to be a big problem at golf courses and shopping centers. People turn up, plug in the electric car, and they go away. And only they can unlock it. And this makes customers frustrated as well. They turn up at these places, they want to charge their car, but someone's away for several hours, and, and they can't charge their car. And so what we do is we use ALPR, but we invoice per minute on a sliding scale. So the longer you stay, the more you pay. Um, and so if someone parks for eight hours, then you're going to essentially what they've got is a three, four hundred dollar parking spot. And for us, that's OK. We'll happily take that money. But for most normal people, they'll come back and move their cars after the initial 25 minutes. Now, all of that is boring, normal business development. The thing that's really interesting is down here, and it's stressor number 14. Stressor number 14 is called icing. ICE stands for internal combustion engine, and it's the way that the electric car industry talks about fossil fuel-driven vehicles. And icing is a phenomena that starts to occur in the United States. And what happens is, one day, some guy is standing watching someone charge their electric car. And this person thinks to themselves, that person who bought that electric car probably cares a lot about the environment. And if they care a lot about for the, oh, this is in America, by the way, because you know that Douglas Adams said you make every story believable by adding the words in America. <laughs> um, so they look at this person and say, if they care about the environment, then they probably vote Democrat. And I don't like that. And so what they do is, they drive their pickup truck, park it in front of the charger, right? and they get out, and they do a little TikTok where they're dancing, and, and then they show all the electric car drivers all frustrated and angry in a queue. And this is called icing. And they put it on TikTok, and it spreads like wildfire, and this happens everywhere. This is where we're at as a society. And this is one of these things that isn't in the spec, it's not a requirement, it's not a risk. No one's thought about these things. But the combination of the residues for 12, 3, and 8 that we talked about means that when someone does this to us, firstly, we have their license plate. Secondly, we have redundancy, so they'll have to bring all their friends if they want to hurt us. We have security cameras for a potential police report, and they're going to pay on a sliding scale. So they're going to have to make it a very quick TikTok. What this means is that this X, this red X that we couldn't predict, we couldn't see, we didn't know was there, 
is just handled by the system because it's reached this, this level of, of, of criticality, which we'll talk about in a minute. And this is the benefit we see of designing systems in this way. And if you thought that this was an American problem, this is Munich, where someone using exactly the same logic looked at an electric car and thought, this person is more likely to be vegetarian. So I'm going to show them. And so they stuck mincemeat into the chargers. Nowhere, anywhere, in any requirement specification ever have you written requirement 6.3.4, some clown is going to stick mincemeat in the device. <laughs> this is the world we live in. This is what we've got to prepare our software systems for. This is the kind of thing that happens in a disordered system. Now, what we're actually doing here is we're taking, as architects, we're taking responsibility for something completely different than what we do as developers. As developers, we take responsibility for the correctness of a program. And it has to run correctly, and it has to be consistent, and we have to be able to rely on it. As an architect, we're working with something different now, and it's called criticality. And criticality, we go back to Kaufman and his models. Every system has a certain n number of nodes and a certain k number of connections between those nodes. And in software, you can, there's two heavily debated choices. Let's have a very small n and very small k. And that's a low number of components, low number of connections. Now, we call this a monolith. And let's have a another kind of system, very high end, lots of components, lots of connections. We call this microservices. And the problem with our monolith is that it's so big and clumsy that if you take out one part of it, the whole system stops working because there's so few components and they're so dependent on each other. The problem with the microservice architecture up here is that there's so many components and so many links that that solves the problem. Right? If you take out one component, the rest of the system will still be running. The problem is that it takes operations three weeks to figure out which component, why it happened, and nobody, everyone forgot to do the, the job with telemetry, and nobody really knows. And what happens with these kinds of systems in a biological setting, Kaufman says, is that they die. They collapse under the weight of managing themselves. They're simply too complicated to continue living. And Kaufman says that there's this optimal line in our systems. He calls it the edge of chaos to the delight of every management consultant everywhere. Um, but it's a, a better word for it is criticality. And when you're on this line, you have a sufficient number of m nodes or modules and connections to survive change, uh, but not so many that you die under the weight of managing them. And what we've done with this method is we started off with something small and innocent and stupid, and we stressed it. And when we stress it in our architecture, our first residue will break it up. We say, this needs, to be, this needs to be modular. We need to separate these things to protect the system. And we keep doing that, and we keep doing that. And at the point where you start to survive things that you didn't know were there, you know you're somewhere on or near this green line. And you can start with a monolith, or you can start with microservices, and this process will push you back towards that green line all the time. And so as architects, we take responsibility for being on that green line, for criticality as opposed to correctness. And that's a huge mental shift if you're coming from programming into architecture. And it also makes it clearer why they're two completely different things. Now, how do we integrate these things together? What we do is we use something called contagion analysis. And Whenever we have our innocent little architecture, which might look like this, we still have this possibility that Xs or stressors are going to pop up in that business environment that we don't understand and don't know. And that stressor will hit a component and destroy it. But what usually happens is that it hits more than one component. And the problem with this is that this is that in network science, when you have a relationship like this between the stressor in C and the stressor in G, we can say that these, these components, this relationship, means that C and G actually have a relationship. They're connected in some way in network science. In software, we would say that they're coupled. 
And that's a surprise if you look at this architecture. What this means is that there's an invisible coupling between C and G. And as you move through the process of stressing your system, you'll find that there's this massive invisible web of coupling in your system. This is why things start to flake and crack and break. And because we have a pretty good idea of the functional relationships, most of these lines represent non-functional concerns. And so what we've accidentally discovered is a way to uncover non-functional requirements that's a way more effective than bullying stakeholders into answering questions like, what are your scalability requirements? Um, they don't like that when we do that. And so what we're doing is we're trying to make sure that when we force all our residues together into one set of one component structure, that we don't arrest them, we don't create this invisible coupling and build something that's actually even worse than what was there before. And we do this through a kind of network analysis. And the best way to analyze the network is through a matrix. And what we do is we write down all our randomly simulated stressors as rows and all our potential functions or components as columns. And we just move through saying, if the stressor touches a function, it gets a, it gets a 1. If it doesn't touch it, it gets a 0. And then we add all of these up. And what this matrix gives us is an immediate visual clue. There's seven different things in here that tells us you need to refactor. You need to work with P. You need to, know, you need to, to, to do some architecture here. First, we look for the stressors that cause the most damage. That's where K is highest. And we deal with them. And you can see here that the second thing we see is that when you have two ones in the same row, you have that potential invisible coupling happening. And here you can see that someone's decided to put all of these things on one server. And so the, the refactoring is fairly obvious. We need to do something about that redundancy or spread them out. Another thing we see is those functions or components that also have very high K, a high number of connections. That means either that this function is incredibly vulnerable and we need to protect it extra, or we've put too much stuff inside it and its attack surface for the environment around it is really big and we need to refactor and split this out. Other things we can see in here is that you can add all these numbers up and divide them by the number of elements, and you can get a value for k. And if that value is bigger than 3, you know you're in trouble. Your architecture is too interconnected. Other things we see is these zeros down here. These are places where we forgot to think about the system. Or either this thing is completely invulnerable and can't be hurt, or we haven't thought about it enough. And the final thing is that any two components that have the same pattern of response to stress, the same set of ones and zeros all the way down, or just even similar, they're going to live and die together. So you might as well push them together into one component. And what we're doing there is we're decreasing n. This entire exercise is about decreasing n, decreasing k, increasing p, which means more stability in the architecture that we're going to deliver. And this means that if you're the architect using these ideas, Whenever someone asks you, why is there three components here, not two, not four, you'll be able to point to this and say, math, rather than, I don't know. That's much more impressive. <laughs> Finally then, and the thing that makes this work stand out from all the other ways of doing architecture, we can actually prove that we've done something useful. And for a lot of architects, that's a big step. So we start off with our naive architecture, and we create a list of stressors. And from that list of stressors and with our contagion analysis, we create an entirely new architecture, which is our residual architecture. And what we do is we bring in a second set of stressors, a second set of things that, that weren't in our original specification. And we surprise both our architectures with these things. And we run through our naive architecture with these red stressors. And we say, does it survive? If it survives, it gets a point. If it doesn't survive, it gets zero points. And we do the same thing with our residual um, architecture. And we add all these points up. And for this architecture, we call it x. And for this architecture, we call it y. And then we calculate a little number, which we call the residual index. 
which is y minus x, so we're really asking the question, is y bigger than x, divided by s, which is the number of red stressors. This will give us a number between minus 1 and 1. And if that number is bigger than 0, what we've done is demonstrably shown that our new architecture is better placed to survive unspecified things than the old architecture. And we've actually moved towards that green line. And we can do this in iterations. Um, and as you do this in iterations, you'll get closer and closer to 0, and then you know you're finished. And this changes how we think about software architecture completely. It's very close to machine learning techniques of the original stressors or a training set, a testing set, um, a, a training set, and then a testing set. So what this gives us is an entirely new theory of software engineering. It's a fusion of software engineering. There's a bit of philosophy in there. And complexity science. And this is concrete as well. The tools are easy. It's a spreadsheet and a matrix, which is also a spreadsheet. You can teach this to anyone. It's properly researched. So this, this isn't just some speculation. Uh, this has been put through the mill. And it's compatible with everything else. You don't have to throw anything out or stop doing anything. You can use this with anything. One of the complaints I hear is that I went to your session and I didn't really know how to implement this. These ideas are easily bigger than object orientation. You won't know how to do this after 45 minutes. This is just a, a, an introduction. But if you want to learn more, there's a book that's just been released, um, which I, I, I have published over the last eight years, a whole bunch of academic articles. and. What I heard from people was that they're horrible. We don't like the academic language and all the math. Oof. So the book has been written to make this stuff more accessible. Um, and you have my email and other contact details on here if you want to follow them. So thank you for coming and for listening. And enjoy the rest of your conference.